4.03 p.m. on Tuesday, March 15, 2022, at the Temecula Valley Unified School District's Administration Center, conference facility rooms A through C. Are there any requests for changes to the agenda? I'll take a motion and a second to approve the agenda as presented. Moved by Mrs. Hinkson. Moved. Seconded by Mrs. Barco. Moved. <laughs> gotcha, Steve. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 We're opposed? The motion carries 5-0. In accordance with government code section 54957.7, the board will meet in closed session for consideration of the items listed in section E. There, yeah, okay. <laughs> there is no reason for us to meet in closed session. The governing board now welcomes public comments. This is a time for closed, oh no, we're not doing closed session public comments. Okay, we'll go through attendance and our Pledge of Allegiance and move on. In attendance, we have myself, Mr. Adam Skumovitz, President, Ms. Barbara Brosh, Clerk, Mrs. Sandy Hinkson, Mr. Stephen Schwartz, virtually still recovering from his shoulder surgery, and Mrs. Allison Barclay. We have Secretary to the Board, Dr. Jody McClay, Superintendent, Mrs. Nicole Lash, Assistant Superintendent, Business Support Services, Dr. Karen Valdez, Assistant Superintendent, Educational Support Services, Mr. Frank Arce, Assistant Superintendent, Human Resources Development, Mrs. Kimberly Velez, Assistant Superintendent, Student Support Services, and Mrs. Lene Anasibar, Executive Assistant to the Superintendents. We'll now do the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty, justice for all. All right, moving on to public comments. Public comment is restricted to only items listed on the special meeting agenda. All comments will be lim limited to three minutes in the order received to a maximum total time of 30 minutes. Unless the item has been placed on the public agenda, the published agenda in accordance with the Brown Act, there shall be no action taken. No discussion will be made regarding personnel issues in open session. All public comments are an important part of the board meeting and are given careful, careful consideration by the governing board. We have one public comment. First up will be Mr. Jeff Kingsburg. There we go. Well, first and apparently last, I, I have some rather unprepared comments today, but I, uh, I just wanted to use this opportunity. I know you're talking about facilities, and um, I, I know there's a, a vision with facilities, a, a large vision that needs to be realized, and I've had a chance to be part of that process with the, um, um, the group that's been, been meeting periodically. But I just want to use this opportunity to share that, that you know, in representing our 1,300 teachers and specialists, I continue to hear concerns about a very basic facilities need, um, and that being window coverings. And um, you know, I, I, I know our people want to, want to be safe. They want safety for their staff and for themselves and for their students. Um, I know those things were in the works uh, before the pandemic. Uh, there were efforts being made, and I, and I vaguely recall there may be a, an update coming soon at a board meeting. But I just, I just wanted to get that out there and put it on record that um, as we look at the big vision, we also need to look at the, you know, the basics um, as well. Um, you know, and, and memory served me to recall that, that TVA uh, helped support a member who presented a grievance back in late 2018 on this, and the board reviewed it. And so... Uh, we're, we, we may go out to our members and kind of find out how, you know, why that concern is about the window coverings, who has them, who doesn't, uh, and bring that information back to you. But I just, just want to take a minute and, and share that and put that on your radar to, to you know, something that, um, you know, the district has been intending to address and has probably been in the process of addressing, but I wanted to share that on behalf of our members. So thank you. Thank you for that. 
So moving on to the workshop, Mrs. Lash, facilities future ready update. I can get one more though. Do you want my laptop? So good evening, I don't know if four o'clock technically constitutes evening, but hello. Um, we're so excited to be here to talk facilities with you today. Um, we have our director of facilities here tonight, Mrs. Janet Dixon. Also here is the architect and principal from DLR Group, the um, consultant that we hired to perform the facility master plan. So Kevin Fleming is here. He'll be up uh, giving a little bit of a presentation and an update in a bit. And also here tonight is Charles Heath. Um, I know it's not, it's on the agenda next as an action item, but he is a consultant contract that's um, up for consideration regarding a bond feasibility study. He's here to answer any questions you might have as well. So I've listed um, everyone here just for your reference. And just so you know, uh, in the background of this beautiful picture is actually Vail Elementary School. Um, I just thought it was a nice little addition to, to see our facilities in some of this presentation. My clicker is on. No, it's not. Oh, I lied. I did email it um, in the email that you responded to, I think is I should be attached. Okay. So we're going to uh, start tonight's presentation with talking about the different buckets of money or different types of facility funding. I'll be going through that. Then Mrs. Dixon will be walking you through a construction update, some completed projects, projects in the works. Uh, Mr. Fleming will then move on to the facility master plan. We've got a, a video to show you as well as an update to give you. And then I will be back up here talking uh, future bond considerations at the end. And so, <clears throat> we good? So when we talk about our message, school is a building with four walls and tomorrow inside. I just love that message. Um, and there's debate over who said it first, but um, I just felt that was really appropriate to begin tonight's conversation with. So if you look at that stool, the three-legged stool, when we talk about funding, there are three main sources or primary sources of funding when we talk facilities. The first one is developer mitigation. There are two different types of developer mitigation revenue, and we'll go through those on the next slides. Uh, there's local bonds, and so as you know, this district issued a local bond about a decade ago, Measure Y. And then there's also state school facility bonds, where they issue bonds at the state level, and those uh, dollars are used to match local revenue. So we'll go through all three of those different buckets of money. First, starting with what we call level one developer fees. So when someone wants to develop and uh, have construction or reconstruction, they'll go to the city and ask for uh, to pull a permit. And the city will say, you got to go talk to TVUSD and pay your developer fees before we can issue you that permit. So this is a per square foot amount. The rates are set by the state allocation board um, in January of even numbered years. And then any rate changes at a local level, we will bring to the school board for consideration and uh, decision as to the rates that we are charging. They're accounted for in Fund 25. 
and their use is restricted for projects accommodating growth of student populations. Sometimes it's called overcrowding and things like that. Um, on average, and this fluctuates between the two millions and the five millions, but over the past five years on average, we've collected about 4.6 million annually. The balance starting this fiscal year was that $18.9 million number, and our available balance, or um, what we're calling available, which it means we haven't committed them towards projects yet, for this bucket of money is approximately $13.4 million at the end of this year. And I say approximately because we have commitments made and we all know the construction costs and change orders come and the cost of goods goes up. So these are all projections currently built into the budget. <laughs> when I do that, just do it like it's working. <laughs> <laughs> the second type of developer mitigation revenue is community facilities districts, or also known as Melarus, and those of us that live in Temecula, many of us are very familiar with Melarus taxes. Um, these are mit uh, uh, in lieu of developer fees, and the mit mitigation is negotiated between the developer and the school district. We are currently in the process of selling bonds for CFD 2017-1 and we are also forming CFD 2022-1. So on the next slide, uh, it shows a, kind of a hard to read map there, but it lists all of the existing CFDs in the district and a map of where those developments are located. So CFDs are housed in Fund 25, and the, their use is restricted to items identified in the mitigation agreement. So each CFD has a mitigation agreement that explicitly uh, states what you can spend those funds on. And over time, we've gotten better about making that language a little bit more vague, so we have more flexibility. Some of it is a, a very specific, and so there's a range of things that um, these funds can be used for. You can see the balance beginning this year is about 13.1 million. The projected available balance at the end of this year is about, is about 13.4 million, just coincidental that it's the same number that you saw on the previous slide at 13.4 million. So the next bucket of money are general obligation bonds, and these are local bonds issued through uh, voter indebtedness. They're accounted for in Fund 21, and the funds must be used in the manner in outli outlined in the election language, right? So you go out for a bond election, you say, here's how we're gonna spend the funds, and then you actually have to spend the funds in that manner. There's a Citizens Oversight Committee, that's what that COC stands for, a Citizens Oversight Committee is formed and they kind of act as a liaison or a, uh, or a conduit between the community and the district. They have meetings and they, um, th they have quarterly meetings and they provide an annual report to the board. For our Measure Y bonds, we just last year issued the last series of the Measure Y bonds, Series D, and so that one is, uh, Final issuance, we are, we are fully at full capacity with the issuance on the Measure Y. The balance beginning this year is 79.9 million and the projected available balance for the life of that bond right now is about 51.7 million in uncommitted amounts. If that makes sense. Do I need my lights on? Uh, when you say uncommitted, but you said it was outlined in the election language, for what it's supposed to be used for. So what is that bond supposed to be used for? So when I say uncommitted, it's we have projects in the queue that the board has already approved mm -hmm. that we'll be using these funds for. So there are lots of other cons facility or construction projects that we could commit these fun to funds towards in the future um, that we just haven't made decisions on yet. So when I say 51.7 million of the remaining bond funds, that's how much we have not committed towards any projects yet. But when the bond was voted on, what did it say it was for in that election? My understanding, it was it was fairly vague, okay. not overly vague, but right. construction, modernization okay. of facilities. Is there anything more specific? There were about three hundred and fifty million dollars worth of projects listed, and it was one hundred and sixty-five million dollar project. Got it. <laughs> within the Perfect. Of Excellent. Thank you. State matching. So um, 
there are two different matchings uh, that can occur at the state level. So again, the state issues bonds, and then they match with our local facility dollars, 50-50 for new construction, which, which is based on enrollment, or 60-40 for modernization. And that's based on age of facilities along with enrollment. Relos or relocatables, portable classrooms, those are every 20 years. Permanent construction every 25 years. So um, how these work is you front the money locally and, and then often years later you will receive that state match back. Those dollars have to go back to the pot that paid for the funds up front and be spent in accordance um, with that language. So um, the detail that I passed out to you on the legal size paper shows the detail breakdown of these dollars down, amounts down below. So over the next decade, if uh, for eligibility of state matching, if the district were to spend $95 million shown in um, the detail that you have, we could be eligible for state match of $142.5 million. So the idea is the district spends $95 million but gets $237.6 million potentially in projects. Does that make sense? The one issue with that is uh, there's no state bonds. There's no money existing currently for that match. So the last state bond that was issued it was 2016, and all of those funds are um, gone. They are already allocated. Prop 13 was on the ballot uh, March 2020, terrible timing, um, and it failed, I think, just for, you know, it was the onset of the pandemic, and as you can imagine, um, it was just kind of, just like I said, bad timing. There are bond proposals on the current ballot, um, but even if none of these come to fruition, when we talked at uh, first interim in December, I mentioned that there's a, an incredible surplus at the state level in the general fund. One of the things that that surplus can be used for is to put towards this state facility program. And so there is a request currently that eight to $10 billion worth of that surplus be put towards um, those state facility projects, and so which would be nice because then it wouldn't have to pass, go through a, a bond measure. Currently, of the eight to 10 billion, if we got any of that, um, there's $3 billion in the queue already of approved projects that would be first in line. Good news is TVUSD is some of that queue. We do have projects that are in the queue should that come to fruition. So this will be something that we'll wanna keep an eye on if the, those state matching dollars come to fruition, whether it's through the bond proposals or through uh, the governor releasing some of the general fund surplus. Can I, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, but just while we're on that slide. So when it says we need to, where are you? Um, when it says we need to provide matching funds, where can those come from anywhere? Can they come from the other sources or do they have to come like from so a would, specific source? It would come from, um, and it depends on where it is, but it would come from those first buckets of money that okay. I talked about mm -hmm. where allowable. So let's say there's, uh, there, it has to meet the criteria of that bucket of money, right? So if we wanted to use our bond dollars to match it, it would have to fall within the bond language. Or if we wanted to use CFD dollars, it would have to fall within the CFD language, if that makes sense. Okay. So I have a question on that too, because I know when we did like the theater and things like that, I mean, it took a long time to get our money back and you alluded to that. Um, uh, some of the things that we have in the queue now, does that include the K-8 school, uh, Rancho, modernization and veil vale. so is that are those dollars that we're going to expect in the queue some yes, years down the road the they're in the queue mm -hmm. and those are pretty major projects so we would be hopefully expecting some of those dollars back as part of that three billion you were just talking about. well just for example um we've got veil up there we didn't have that much eligibility on Vail. So even though we spent $25 million on the project, we're only getting about $3 million back because that's all the modernization eligibility we have. So oftentimes, in order to get the project you want, you end up spending more than just what your match is in order to, to achieve the goal. So on this one, we're getting about $3 million back. Um, I think Rancho, we have about $6 million in eligibility, again, that was about a $25 million project. So we're not getting 60% of the project back. 
The K-8, we are getting very little back. Um, the only new construction eligibility that we have right now is special education. And so we are only getting enough uh, back for the special education portion, plus 50% of the side of uh, the cost of the site. So I don't remember exactly what the number is, but it's not half the project. Because new construction is based off that on enrollment, right? Yeah. So We, um, well, it depends on how you look at it. <laughs> um, we took down what we would call interim housing because it was portable and put up new construction, or permanent construction. So as far as eligibility for spending it, we did use uh, developer fees and CFDs because we were taking out buildings that were just interim and putting in permanent. Same with Rancho Elementary. As far as the state program goes, it, we were able to apply for it under modernization. Okay, all right. I'm going to take you through some projects that have just recently been completed and then a couple that we have out to bid right now. So the French Valley campus is currently occupied by Home Instead. What you see there is one of the two classroom buildings and um, this is the administrative building in the front, and then on the right-hand side, you see the lobby. Nutrition services is part of the multi-purpose room, and on the right is some of the interior. And even though we're not serving lunch out there right now, our nutrition services department is using the freezer and refrigerator as extra storage when there is a full-time campus out there that, of course, that will be utilized. And then the multi-purpose room on the right, you can see it's being used for their um, PE um, program after school. And those are uh, the benches there fold down. So what's the back would fold down. It could be used as lunch tables. And you can see on the left there that the multi-purpose room has doors, operable doors that open up. So while they're windows now, they could be open up to extend the, the capacity into the lunch area. There's a couple different kinds of classrooms within the classroom buildings. There's the standard classrooms like you see on the left, and then each of the two classroom buildings has a laboratory in it. So that's a science lab, and the lab in the other building is more like a tech lab. And then within the interior of the buildings, you've got project areas. So the classrooms, you can see have those nano walls, which are the operable glass walls. So if students were to go out and work out in the hallway, the teacher would have good visibility, or you could actually open them up and extend the use of the classroom. You can see they're set up there to be used independently. The walls are closed. And then um, the double doors there on the green wall, that is, a small workspace where a small group of students or adults could go and work right now. It's being used as an office for one of the teachers that is delivering the curriculum online. Our other big uh, modernization recently was Rancho Elementary School. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that is the administration building and we basically doubled the size of the administration building. So here's the interior, so where you walk in, it also now has a, a conference room. Um, and then down the entire hallway over to the right is all the new area. So you've got a nurse's office, restrooms, and a couple other offices. The old portion of the administration building was converted into the teacher's lounge and workroom. The multi-purpose room was redone to add new lighting and sound, and we redid the flooring. Ceilings were redone throughout the campus, so those are all new ceilings. And we removed a lot of portables, again, and put in a permanent classroom building. Um, the Idea Lab is a makerspace. It's on the end of the classroom building there, and you can see the interior on your right. Also in the building is a library. And the picture on the right is the library, and on the left, another picture of the Idea Lab that you can see it's got the operable glass walls on both sides. There is a small kind of conference room size room in between. 
So the idea lab or the library can be linked to that room or all three rooms can be linked together and you can see, you can see all the way through the building there. And there's the exterior, the classroom portion and one of the uh, classrooms that's in the new building. There are project rooms uh, inside building five, which is the new building. Uh, on your left, and then we redid the project room in building four. It's got new flooring and again, new ceilings, and we redid some of the casework. Um, you've heard about the retention wall and the bus loop. We, as you know, we had a contractor that went out of business, and he had some repairs to do on those that just recently got approved through DSA. So we do have some structural work to do on that, which is we just have an agreement with the, um, with the bond folks now, so that work can start. Okay, out to bid right now, we have the Chaparral High School modernization. So we've got two uh, deferred maintenance project, the pool refurbishment and also redoing the gym floor. Those will be done this summer. And then the front parking lot will be removed and replaced. It has gone past the point where it can be repaired, so it's a complete overhaul. Uh, we are also replacing the fire alarm, doing exterior paint, starting work on the foyer and the, uh, the theater. So work that will continue into the fall will be the gym foyer, which will become the new uh, entrance to the, uh, to the gym. And then for ADA purposes, we're redoing the restroom adjacent to it. The theater is getting new lighting and sound. And again, ADA upgrades within the theater and also the restrooms outside. And then the fire alarm will be work will be complete in the fall as well. Another item that we were going to do was replacing the swamp coolers with heat pumps. Um, unfortunately, there has been a delay in being able to get the material. So while we are bidding the material now, we won't be able to install it until next summer. Otherwise, we'd be installing it during the school year and that won't work. So the second project, the oh, exterior paint, um, we are kind of changing up the colors a little bit, adding a little contrast to give it some more depth. So that's uh, what it will look like. And then the auditorium, as I said, we're doing the ADA upgrades, so it's the seating arrangement will change a little bit for the wheelchair uh, seating. There is some seating, partial seating replacement, yeah. Okay, Vintage Hills Elementary School is also out to bid. We're actually opening those bids on Thursday. There is a lot of ADA work to do on the exterior, so it'll have a little bit different entrance there. This is another project where we are planning to replace the air conditioning on the main building in the 12th plex this summer, but again, due to the uh, delay in getting material, we're actually splitting this project up, so we're doing everything except the air conditioning and part of the roofing this summer, and then we'll come back next summer and do the air conditioning and the roofing. So the security, we will be uh, placing some doors in the lobby there and a pony wall and gate all the way over to the administration desk there in the front. And then when you walk in, rather than being able to turn left and take the ADA ramp down to the library, we will be closing that off and including a different ADA ramp, taking the staircase that's now the main entrance and taking half of that to become the uh, new ADA ramp. So the library will be pretty significantly reconfigured. Okay. So as Kevin comes up, I'm gonna have uh, you go ahead and press play on the video as Mr. Kevin Fleming, Fleming makes his way up. Temecula started off there uh, far more rural, uh, you know, 25 years or so ago when I started in the district. I think all we had was the one restaurant, Marie Callender's, which is no longer there, sadly. Um, we didn't even have a mall at that point. When I came to the district, I believe we had eight schools. Um, we now have 28 schools. 
We raised our children here, brought our children through the schools as well, so it's just a real family atmosphere. So in school districts, it's always really, really important to be thinking about uh, the future. You know, we're large organizations. When you think about it from a facilities perspective, we have a huge footprint. We have many, many facilities, um, and just the, the overall maintenance needs of those facilities can be overwhelming. But to really think and tie our facilities to our mission, and that is to educate kids, we need to always be looking at the future. So what is it our kids will need? Because it's gonna take us a while from a facilities perspective to be ready for that. In my experience, I would define a facilities master plan as basically kind of a strategic roadmap, a definition of all of your facilities within your organization, what they're each comprised of, and then most importantly, what your vision for those facilities really is um, for each of them, not just the district as a whole. So each of our school sites would go through uh, quite a thorough analysis of what they have on their campus and how that supports teaching and learning but more importantly, what their vision is for teaching and learning and how their facilities could best support that vision. Most school districts will have a master facilities plan. Um, it's typically done anywhere between every 10 and 20 years. Our last one in Temecula Valley was probably 10, maybe 12 years or so ago. So it's just kind of naturally time to look at it again. You know, the needs of students change, the needs of teachers change, our pedagogy changes, and how we go about, you know, teaching and learning changes. So we always need to be prepared. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that all of the things in the master facilities plan are going to get done, but it really gives us a roadmap. It gives us a strategic roadmap. Should we acquire the funds? Should we get the funds? Are we looking for projects? It, it also helps a district, especially a large district, prioritize what the needs are when funds are available. I'm Kevin Fleming, the principal architect with DLR Group and uh, assisting the district with the development of their master plan. So what is a master plan? Our approach to master planning is to create a transparent process and product for the community to participate with. And this culminates in a, a web-based interactive master plan, so we're leveraging technology to its advantage to reach as many people as possible. We've developed a specific master plan for each campus. The campus plans were the culmination of all the input that we received from the community and the participants at each campus. And each one of these will have separate projects or phases that can be implemented over time in the 10-year process that we're looking at. Okay, so one of the more important aspects of master planning is to kind of look at the equity and parity throughout the district. So we compile a series of metrics you know, just data points that the district can refer to when decisions are being made about prioritization. So one of the first things that we looked at is just the facility utilization. These are simple data points like square feet allocated per student, um, how many students per acre, the density of the site, and what is the capacity of each site? You know, how many students are enrolled at that particular campus and how much room is there for growth or how much need is there for additional facilities. Another important aspect of the master plan is to understand your enrollment and where it might be heading in the next seven to 10 years. So we will use a demographer to determine what each campus's projected enrollment is for the next seven years. That will help us determine where the need might reside in the district. Okay, another metric we like to look at is student need. And it's as simple as the number of socially economically disadvantaged students associated with a specific campus, or students with high mobility, disabled students, or English learners, so that we know that we're reaching out and understanding where those needs reside in the district as well. When it's all said and done, we'd like to make sure we understand what the total cost impact of the master plan is. So we will look at each campus, what their total cost is, and these costs include the soft costs, the things that aren't part of the construction, like your reviewing costs, your plan check agencies, your, your inspections, and everything required to develop the project, as well as escalating costs. What is it going to cost five years from now as opposed to today? So why are we doing this? We're trying to develop a metric for the district to look at, to create a transparent decision-making process that can clearly illustrate why projects were prioritized. 
TVUSD schools and students would not be where they are today without the amazing support of our parents and our community. In fact, it's one of the things we pride ourselves on in Temecula is the amount of involvement and the hours of support that all of the adults within our valley put into our schools and our students. So uh, for those folks involved in this process, thank you, thank you immensely. Your voices are being heard and, and they are of critical importance to developing the best plan we can develop. Thank you, sir. I'd like to make sure everybody's aware that Dr. McClay has gone viral now on YouTube. It will work out. <laughs> so just for everybody's edification, that particular video we produced for two reasons. One of them is we use that to open all of our community, community outreach meetings so that the same message is delivered because we're doing them online. So it kind of works out that everybody kind of hears the same message, and I think it's always important to come from the leadership on that side. And then we also have put that on the web page. This is a slightly edited version that doesn't refer to community meetings and evenings. So it's a general message that goes on the opening page. So I'll kind of give you an update of where we're at. So we have our outreach going on, so we're kind of, we're closing in on the outreach, except for what I'm gonna talk about the digital survey, but we have our core planning group. We meet every two weeks, give or take, depending on availability, because it's been a crazy year, as everybody knows. Um, that's been going very well, great leadership team. Um, we just started the AdSpec committee, which will be an additional <clears throat> kind of series of meetings to go up between now and June. Uh, site committee meetings, we've had 32 of them, one at each school, that included a tour with the principal and some key people and we had about 317 participants I think we're shy about 2025 I have three schools that I don't have the list for yet but that should grow community forums we have 27 of them of which the final are tomorrow and Thursday and we'll have a final count for their participants but I think they've ranged between 7 and 20 um, that have been showing up for them which is actually fairly common um, digital surveys, now that we have a bunch of feedback, we normally put it into a survey where we'll, you know, we heard shade on campuses, maybe, you know, window coverings, all these little items that we've heard about, we'll put them together into a survey in a digital form and we'll push that out to anybody that wants to take it and it normally goes like, pick the five things that are most important to you. So we can get a feel from the community that way as well. So some of the things that we have been hearing, just so we know, um, and you notice window shades is on here. So shade on the playgrounds and play equipment, ubiquitous across all elementary schools and middle schools at this point. Um, shaded outdoor learning areas yet to be defined with the Ed Spec Committee. Parking and drop off modifications at some of the schools, um, that especially the ones that are older and the ones that are a little bit more stable and crowded. Larger outdoor gathering spaces, and this kind of comes with the, everybody wants to be outdoors these days. It's kind of shifted that uh, perception. Uh, specialty classrooms, if we don't have the appropriate spaces for your STEM programs, your maker spaces, PE programs are often compromised on inclement weather days. The window shades, perimeter fencing at some of the schools, the visibility and the height of the fencing, it's there, it provides security, but it may not provide enough. Um, some of the elementary schools, I, um, what I call the bird plans, they um, are requesting larger multi-purpose rooms. They have kind of smaller versions and they can't get a full class in that. And then I'll, pretty much across the board, all the middle schools want gyms. I think that's been expressed before my arrival here as well. So. Where we're at, we're developing the web pages as we go through it. There's a lot of documentation and data to collect as we go through here. When you open up the web page, I don't have the live version because I did my screenshots for this presentation, but this is what you'll see. Everything down below the where it says master planning chapters will explain how we provided the information, the participants, the video that we talked about will all be on this front page. Then everything else goes under find my school in summary. So I'm gonna kind of walk through the summary. So in the video, we touched on this. So your facility utilization dashboard, 
this is just when you're making comparisons. When you're on the actual website, you can click on any of these schools or any combination of schools or just cohorts, elementary, middle, and it'll recalculate the data so that you can make your comparisons about which schools are the most crowded, which ones have the most students per acre, which ones have their capacities, highest end capacity and maybe excess capacity. Um, this is kind of going on to your immediate needs. So what we're talking about here is your um, facility assessments. So this is when we went through and looked at the condition of your current facility, snapshot in time. And um, what you're seeing here is the immediate needs category is what kind of should be done right now if there's like some ADA issues that we should address and those type of things. Short term, long term, up to 20 years will show you what the needs are at each school and what the repair cost and what the maintenance schedule should be to accomplish, accomplish that. And then when we're looking at the enrollment projections, um, without getting into the weeds on this, you guys are fairly stable over the next seven years. It's, it's a, what I call enrollment shifting more than it is enrollment increases. Some schools have increases, some schools have decreases. So the master plan will take into account those shifts that we are pro kind of projecting forward. And then kind of an example, since we don't produce the master plans until we get all the input from the community, um, this is what they will look like. So this is just an example from a previous master plan we've done where you'll have the campus site plan, it'll tell you what the projects are that we're outlining for that. This is kind of the whole thing, it's the wrap up. So everything on this master plan, including building it out five years, <clears throat> a 5% escalation per year, 10% contingency on top of it, this was a $33.5 million project. Now when you get into your prioritization exercises, you can say, oh, we're gonna do this in two years. You can actually just click on two and it'll recalc the numbers for you accordingly. So you can kind of build the master planning budgets on your prioritization list. And how you do that is on that summary page again, you can actually, it'll have all of the projects. It won't have the visual with it, but you can pick which options you want for any particular school and you can build the the, the bond list or the project list accordingly. And I think that's where I end at this point. And I'm not sure if questions come now or later. They'll come in now. Okay. <laughs> so to circle back on two things, uh, number one, I, I know it brings a smile to my face when I go through those pictures that Janet presented of the completed projects and how amazing our facilities look. I've uh, been talking with Dr. McClain. We want to get a rib ribbon cutting ceremony together for the um, site that's occupied by Home and Said currently, as well as Rancho Elementary School, and then some bus tours for those two sites as well, um, including Vail Elementary School. So those are things, especially now that some of these COVID restri restrictions are lifting, that we're going to uh, get on the calendar for um, all of you to participate in. And the other thing that I wanted to mention was the timeline for the facility master plan. We next steps are the ed specs portion of the, the plan where we really start honing in on our instructional vision and we are going to have a foundational meeting in April where we bring all of the experts, if you will, into the room where we talk kind of at a higher level of ed specs and then from there we will break off into focus groups and those focus groups will involve more folks looking more into the details and we anticipate those focus groups will happen in May. So the timeline for completion for the facility master plan we anticipate to be June um, and we will bring back a presentation with a completed project and an, uh, hopefully an interactive type of viewing of what that looks like at that point, okay? So now moving on to general obligation bond consideration. Um, so the most common type of general obligation bond to issue is a Prop 39 bond. It only requires 55% approval uh, as opposed to um, two-thirds. So with a Prop 39 bond, um, <clears throat> there are some things that come along with that. So it must be held concurrent with a district-wide election, meaning an even-numbered year. So if we didn't go out for a general obligation bond in 2022, we would have to wait till 2024 to, um, to go out for the next one. The limit is $60 per $100,000 of assessed valuation 
and you must um, form a citizens oversight committee. We talked about that for the measure Y that's currently in place, so we would have to form a COC for this uh, new potential bond. And then it also requires an annual financial audit and performance audit. So there are kind of three things to consider when issuing a bond. Number one, the timing, which we talked about. The continuity in funding, right? So if it's not 2022 and it potentially is 2024, how do we bridge that time period with existing funds because our facility needs will continue? Um, and so just kind of, and then thinking through the matching dollars, if the state bond comes, comes to fruition or state matching dollars come to fruition, you know, really maximizing our, our funds to make sure that we, you know, like I said, maximize or utilize our existing funds to the fullest potential. So um, just some items to consider for a potential bond, uh, going out for a bond. On the far left column, you'll see the dollar amount per 100,000 of assessed value. And what wrap means is, is it's up to that $45 amount. So let's say right now we have $25 out in geo bond um, debt to an individual. We would be adding another $20 to get to that $45 per 100, thousand in assessed value rate. The 45 down below was, is if right now, let's pretend we have $25 per 100,000 in assessed value, it's 45 on top of that 25. Does that make sense? So that's what that first column means. The second column is the amount that the district could potentially receive if we were to go out for a bond um, based on the numbers on the left. And we're going to talk, talk about a bond feasibility study. When they do those, the polling, it's not just would you be interested or would you support a bond measure, but to what level or what extent they will get you know, specific in their polling of would you support a bond measure if it was up to $45, if it was an additional $45. So you can see the maximum as we talked about with this type of bond is $60 per $100,000 in assessed valuation. In comparing TVUSD to other districts in the county, you'll notice TVUSD is second to the lowest as far as outstanding geo bond uh, or geo bond tax rates. Again, per 100,000 of assessed valuation, the only district in the county that has less uh, or a lower tax rate is Lake Elsinore. The two yellow lines in the middle, the top one is the medium for the county and the, the bottom one is the average for the county. So if you consider those numbers on the previous slide, we still won't even be anywhere near some of our neighboring districts. So um, just for uh, this group, the board's role, number one, we look to you to, to determine priorities. You serve as conduits to and make sure that input and buy-in is received from various stakeholders. And you are keen participants in um, the facility master plan development. And lastly, um, you know, ensuring that our facilities and our plans for facilities align to our instructional needs and our instructional programs and goals. So with that, and what we're kind of looking to the board for direction on is two things. On the left, prioritization. Staff's recommendation of prioritization are the three things listed there. Number one is the K-8 site, um, currently occupied by Home Instead. We've got a committee formed currently, and we are going to bring to the board what our recommendation is um, in September of 2022 to say what is that site going to be. As you all know, we've only done phase one of that site. There is a phase two that we haven't even begun to um, design. So and the area is perfect, we believe, to draw in higher enrollment, more students, especially from that area. <clears throat> Being right across the street from two charter schools, we hear constantly, we, you know, it's just proximity is the reason why we attend charter schools. When is that school going to open? We get phone calls weekly, if not daily, regarding that location. So uh, from staff's perspective, that would be a priority. And again, um, if you were doing the math, there's about $78.5 million left uncommitted. I'm not saying we would spend all of it on these three things. I'm saying we would have a plan for these three things and then see what's left. We would obviously bring the details of what these, the plans for these three things are back to the board with um, projects for consideration. But as far as a focus goes, these are our priorities. The second would be with the uh, 
occupation of K-8 by uh, in-person instruction, a really nice transition soft landing space for home instead. There will be facility needs wherever we put them and so we would wanna prioritize meeting the needs of that home instead uh, innovation academy program. And then lastly, um, Janet presented phase one of Chaparral High School modernization. We would like to prioritize phase two and what that looks like, how much dollars we're willing to commit towards that project. So staff's recommendation is uh, these three areas to focus on and really bring back uh, with project lists. Now there is, um, a, about a year ago, there was a $1 million project that was approved by the board for the TMS band room. I believe a committee was formed and it was determined that $1 million isn't quite enough to get that, to accomplish what that program is trying to accomplish. So um, that's kind of just lingering out there and what we're going to do with that, are we going to put it on the list with the facility master plan needs and uh, assess valuation or uh, assess priority at that point? You know, that's kind of just hanging out there right now. So that's one portion that we need direction on um, from staff's perspective. The second thing is the action item on the agenda tonight, and that is whether or not um, the board would like to go out to survey the community for their, and just take their temperature with regard to supporting a bond measure. And um, this is in no way a commitment for going out for a bond. This is just to hire a consultant and a polling company to just survey the community, ask, take their temperature on support because there's no way we can recommend one way or another whether or not we go out for a bond without knowing what the support in the community is. Uh, M Dr. McClay said it really well in that video. We, you know, whenever possible, we like to involve the community in these decisions. So in our opinion, it would be best to start there. So with that, um, I know we probably can't until we have a motion discuss the, the second part of that, which is the bond feasibility study, but we can talk about the, the other things. We've got, again, uh, Kevin Fleming and Janet Dixon here, and myself, if you have questions for us. And then once we get to the next item, um, Charles Heath is here, and he can answer your questions for the bond feasibility study. So just to clarify, we can discuss everything except the bond polling or the bond feasibility until we get to that point and then we have to make a motion to open that up. Correct, Correct. that's my understanding. Okay, yep. you guys good talking about everything else and then circling back to that, okay. I have one quick question. So when we're looking at, um, I don't know which slide it is, the potential 2022 bond measure summary where it shows the projected tax rate per 100,000 of assessed value I think it's back a couple slides. Probably one more. One more, yeah. Okay, so um, this is, is this an, on an annual basis per household? So if I'm looking at the first one at $45 and my house is worth, that's per 100,000, my house is worth 300,000, I would be assessed $135 in taxes, is that right? But where it says wrap, now do I have to look at that other chart where you showed us Second it would be the, the 45 minus that 23, minus the, the 23. difference. Exactly. So their increase would be that $23. Okay. Exactly. And Times we, however much your house is worth per okay. 100000 Okay. All exactly. right. I just wanted to make sure I was clear on that. And before we proceed, I just want to say you and I had a conversation after I attended a um, uh, CSBA-sponsored, uh, I don't know, uh, all-day workshop on this topic. and. Um, you really boiled down this information and, and did a great job of simplifying everything that's involved in where our funding comes from, how bond measures work, um, and just all of it, what the board's responsibility is. So really nice job boiling it all down and making it understandable. Thank you for that. Thanks, Sandy. Okay, uh, I guess before kicking it off, I just wanna thank you guys for the presentation. Um, it was organized awesome. It was very easy to understand. I think the video adds a lot for the community and for all the um, events that are going on where we're trying to pull information. Um, very professional, very well done. So I'll start with thank you. Does anyone wanna lead off with specific questions? Why don't we go, why don't we go to the virtual Mr. Mr. Schwartz, do you want to lead us off with any questions or thoughts you might have? Yeah, hey, uh, first of all, could I just ask everyone to make sure they speak into their microphone? Because uh, I missed some of the conversation. I got the gist of most of it. Uh, yeah, I had just had a couple of questions. 
So when we're talking about placement of the Home Instead Innovation Academy, are we talking about when they do come to campus, where are they going to go rather than where they are going now at that French Valley site? Is that correct? Correct, and also where the staff would be housed. So in other words, are we thinking about a school that's underutilized where, uh, to a greater degree? So that would be the place where we, or are we talking about actually building another place? I do not believe we're talking about building another place. It would be on an existing campus. There is the space component, but there's also uh, uh, entrance and exit and, and things like that to consider if it's a separate campus or a separate uh, program. We're looking at those types of things. Okay, and uh, if you could just go back to the slide with the um, bonds, with the wrap. I just want to clarify that in my own mind. So we're saying that um, if we if we um, have a bond issue of 180 180 million dollars, um, each homeowner will pay 45 dollars per $100,000 of assessed value of his home. Is that correct? That's exactly correct, yes. And so, but, with the so wrap, at, that's correct. It's a wrap. I, I always thought a wrap was something else, something you ate but or something you sang, but that's irrelevant. Um, so basically, we're going to go out to the community and saying, look, we need to build these school facilities or we need to improve our facilities. And your part of it is going to be funding part of it, but they're really not, we're not really asking them to pay an exorbitant amount of money for improving our schools. It depends, I guess, on how, uh, the assessed value of your home, but, um, no. but I mean, even if you're, even if you're you have right. a million yeah. dollar home, so you're talking about $450 a year. I mean, that's not exorbitant in terms of the value of your home and improving the schools your kids go to. I mean, it's certain balance of the whole thing. Um, so thank you for clarifying that and thank you for the whole presentation. It was very clear and uh, very well put together. Thank you. Great. Anyone who wants to go next? Mrs. Broch? I have a question um, probably for Mrs. Dixon. On the chaparral, are we looking at the multi-purpose room still, or is that phase two, or did that get scrapped? That would be phase two. It's okay. going to be put with all the other priorities, and then we'll decide. You'll decide. And then also at that same school, the theater flooring, is that phase the, two also? The no? theater flooring? No, Correct. that's that's happening with that's phase happening. one okay. as well. Also, as we're talking, I would I just want to make sure everybody understands the difference between a value, the value of your home and the assessed value of your home. So the assessed value that the hundred thousand is based on is what's on your tax bill. It's not what you can sell your house for today. Yes, correct. Okay, I just want to make Thank sure you. that everybody was clear on that. Yes. When you when you mentioned a million dollars, you know. So I guess my, my last question would be regarding the K-8 school, mm -hmm. um, just because that is the community that I live in, and yes, people are so anxious for the school to open, especially because Bella Vista is so impacted. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the issues that that school tends to carry is from all of those kids. Is there no way to open the school before the next school year? Well, <clears throat> we are really looking for 2023-24 okay. because of the what we believe the um, needs will be to move home instead. We, we're, all of construction takes time, and I, I don't wanna say construction like we're building something from scratch, but even just moving walls, yeah. putting up fencing, materials and things like that, and then having to go through the DSA process potentially for any of that. We're, that's why I'm saying we'll need to probably make a decision by September in order to have it ready for the following year. Wow, okay, yeah. thank you. Mrs. Barclay or Mrs. Sinkson? Okay. I just have a couple of basic questions. I'm gonna play the new card as long as I possibly can. Um, so the website that was referenced with all of that data, where is that? 
So that's what I talked about going live in June. Right okay. now it's in development and that's why some of those slides showed Oceanside Unified Information yeah. is because we haven't uh, completed that yet. So it's in development, it will be available June. I think I said that wrong. Where can we find it? Is it its own website or is it a page on our website? I think it will it be, be both in that there, it, there will be a link okay. on our website where folks can access that information. Okay, awesome. So that is slated to be live once the facilities master plan is complete. Exactly. Got it. Okay. Um, and then just um, the discussion regarding the Homestead Academy. So I know that um, there are a lot more students than had been originally projected. What are the thoughts about how much space they're going to need in the future now that possibly some of the reasoning for parents to engage their kid in, kids in online learning has, has been mitigated. Do we expect some children will be coming back to campus or do we think the size of that is going to remain the same and they will need a lot of space or a little space? What, what, is the thought, what are the thoughts around that? So the reason why we haven't determined where Home Instead is going to go yet <laughs> is because we are currently having those discussions of projected enrollments. In fact, Home Instead's budget meeting where we discuss it projected enrollment, re transfer requests, and all of those good things is uh, happening in two weeks, um, in two weeks. And so at that point, when we look at enrollment and we look at staffing, and then we look at enrollment and staffing district-wide is when we will then look at their best placement. Um, because, but we will make sure that there's enough room for them to um, stay whole or even potentially grow a little bit. Because as you mentioned, it, it's triple the size than we, that we thought it would be year one, so, which is really exciting, right. and we want to make sure that they have a nice transition, a soft landing, and a great space for them. Um, but we do anticipate that being a program that's here to stay. A, not all of those kids are there because, as a result of the pandemic, a lot of them really just found the right fit programmatically for what they were looking for. So we imagine that they will be long-term home instead-ers. Awesome. That's great. And Mrs. Barkley, just to add on to that, mm -hmm. we are watching enrollment. It's a little too soon to tell. We're only two days into, um, no longer with masks at sites, but we're continuing to monitor that each day. So we can monitor over the next couple of weeks to see if there is a decline in enrollment at HIIA or Home Instead back into the schools now that the mask mandate's been um, lifted. So we're monitoring that on a daily basis. But I would agree with Mrs. Lash that there is a lot of students there that have, it's not about the masks, it wasn't about the COVID um, restrictions, it was really about, it's really a great place for my student to do really well. So um, we're continuing to watch those numbers. Great, that's great. Um, and tell me if this question should be for later, but so just understanding the amount of money we're talking about that is uncommitted at this point versus what is going to be needed in the future, is it, this is staff recommending that 2022 is necessary to have a bond because we will run out of money for the projects that need to be handled more immediately? Or is it, if the temperature of the community is such that it seems like it would be better to wait until 2024, is that doable or will we be put in a bad situation? Right, so we are definitely not recommending today that we go out for a bond in 2022. Um, and I, as I mentioned, the only way to answer that question is by surveying the community and taking the pulse of where they are. So it's, we need that information in order for us to make that decision and, and see how close we are to that 55%. Are we over it? Are we under it? Are we right at it? That will also drive the amount of work that it will take to get us to an approved bond measure. And so once, if you approve the consultant agreement tonight and we survey the community, we will bring those results back to the board for consideration to have that discussion of feasibility, as mm -hmm. they call it. Right. Yes, we're doing one in my personal work, so I know all about <laughs> feasibility studies. Um, but so, but that aside, just based on the amount of money needed to cover I think there was the chart, like things that were immediate, 
are we in need of those funds to cover those immediate needs or are we talking about modernization is where those funds would be mostly directed? We could always utilize those funds. Mm -hmm. um, however, we do also remember have funds for maintenance and that's mm -hmm. completely separate. So that's not repairing things mm -hmm. um, or replacing them as they stop working. We have funds, in fact, the board committed 1% of our overall general fund budget to put towards those needs. But is it ever enough? Uh, no. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we, oh, uh, yes. and, <laughs> and, and there are things on those lists. In fact, we had a meeting this morning in executive cabinet to say how much of these things are operational needs rather than wish list items. And could we accomplish paying for them somehow with our existing funds and, and not putting it on the back of um, a bond election in order to accomplish those things. So that's exactly what we're looking at now okay. to not put all of our eggs in that basket in case it's not the right time. You know, the, the economy is um, a, a little unstable at, at the moment and, and what's going on in the stock market. So I don't, I, I won't be disheartened if it comes back and it looks like the um, community is not in support of it right now because it could just be the timing and not necessarily the cause, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And no matter what, we will um, do our very best to s maximize our dollars and use them wisely should we wait till 2024. Okay, great. Thank you. I think, I think that's it for now. So before you jump in, um, I'll just ask my one question because it kind of piggybacks on what Mrs. Barkley was saying. So essentially the master facility plan that we put together, and we saw an example of one of the school districts where it was said 836 million. I looked at, was that Oceanside? Anyways, so I think one way to look at it, and correct me if I'm wrong, is this is, we look at everything, it's a uh, pulse of where we are today, and if we fixed almost everything or or everything for 836 million over the next 10 years, longer than that, is it 10 about? Um, this is how much it would cost. So it's not, I w are we looking at it, is it safe to say we look at it kind of in two separate silos, like this is everything that we need, and then we have this whole budget conversation which, se which seems to be changing every year, every quarter, with what's happening, right, up in Sacramento, right? So, and then we go and prioritize what we can afford, essentially, right? But it seems like, even when Mrs. Dixon was saying, we have our cost, but it's usually quite a bit more, and then we're always kind of pulling back funds from the state or the federal government, and if we get it, great, if not, not. Is that, I mean? Correct, and the one thing that that facility master plan does do is it, it does get the community involved, and so you've got some momentum building a little bit right now with regard to timing. Um, if you consider the 2022 election, if there's support, it would align nicely with we're fresh off of a facility master plan that just got completed, so those needs are up to date and new. Um, and so that the, that's why I think we're starting to talk about this right now because historically that transition is nice, but it, uh, it's all about what the community is, is in support of. And so w it will absolutely still be useful in two years and we'll utilize it for the next couple of years to say where do the priorities lie and what can we do now. Um, but it is, I think we called it a roadmap, right? So if we do go out for another bond, it's not like, well, what are you gonna spend the funds on? I don't know. It's, well, here's all, all of the things that we potentially, yeah, need, exactly. Okay, that helps. Mrs. Hinkson? Wow, I could talk for an hour on this, right? So, I mean, I think that, um, you know, for me, I, I come from the same place as Dr. McClay when she talks looking back in history. I came to the district when I think we had four, four or five elementary schools, two middle schools, one high school. And so we were in that growth phase of a, like a new school or two every year, and we were always new. But now we're coming on the other side of that. We're 30 years old and we're starting to see um, a lot of our facilities have needs to meet our, pro, our um, instructional needs for our students, to meet the, the physical um, environment needs that we have, um, and really just to modernize our facilities and keep pace with um, you know, w what needs to be done in them. So I think, you know, first of all, I just wanna give kudos to everybody who's been involved in this and for the board for approving it because we have to look forward. We have to continue to uh, make sure that we're um, thinking about the needs for the next 10 years. As far as timing goes, I know a couple things have come up. As far as 2022, um, when we're looking at 
the state having a surplus, when we're looking at the state putting a bond measure on the ballot this year, um, it does create some opportunities for us to um, be able to put in our applications and um, be on that list for the potential um, monies. And I know when they score those applications, some of it is do you have a bond measure, do you have the matching funds um, to, um, to go along with the state funding, okay? Um, I think another important thing to understand though is that you know, the, the plan is fluid. I mean, we do have, it's not like we have about $80 million right now and that's, that's it. Because we have money that, you know, we mentioned there's projects that we will be getting some reimbursements for. Um, CFDs and developer, developers fees continue to come in and impact um, that number every year. So it's pretty typical that we have a list that's much larger than um, the monies that we have on hand. Um, but one, one of the things that, you know, in, in, in my almost eight years now on the board has been is that we've had a lot of projects that we've submitted to the state um, and it's been extraordinarily slow getting money back or that money has run out. And we're just sitting there with something that's approved waiting for the state to have money. Okay, and so now that they have money and now that they're considering putting a, um, a state measure forward too, that puts us in a good position now that there's some um, impetus behind um, the, the work that, could, that could, could happen. And so, you know, with our needs for the future and with um, funding being more available than I've seen it in my tenure, I think that it's a great opportunity for us. And whether we, I understand whether we go forward or not, there's factors to consider. Um, but I think that the fact that we address this this year, we're looking 10 years forward, and we're uh, making sure that we are ready for the future is a really important step, okay? Now, one of the things I do wanna comment on was before we started this process with the new master facilities plan, and we were working off our old master facilities plan, the board had identified, I think it was four projects at that time that we had approved. One was the K-8 school. Um, the home instead was not on the, that, that's new because of the pandemic, right? Um, Chaparral modernization was another one that was um, a huge need. Um, Vintage Hills and the TMS band room. And that one rose to the top if we look at some of the emerging common themes that Kevin covered just a while ago. Um, specialty classrooms, including music and PE, um, as well as maker spaces and STEM, has come up at every site. And TMS has come up as the most in need band facility because of the, the, way, it, the, the way it's set up, okay? It just is not supporting the program there. So that was the reason why that one rose up and the board gave a first approval to it, okay? We approved a million dollars. When we went in and did that study, just because of the way the room's tiered and the, the architectural changes, or the structural changes that have to take place, the cost was a little bit bigger, okay? And so I really think that um, if you look at the timing of things, if we delay this project and say we're gonna come back after, the, after June, and then we say, well, okay, now it has to, we've already done the architectural study, then it has to go to, to um, the state for approval, right, to DMS, DSA, I'm sorry, and then it has, and then it's probably still another year out before it starts. So you're still looking at a couple years out. So I just feel like that project, it's not just a new need. That site has been a major need for a very long time. It's been a, a facility that does not function for that program. So I would like to see that added to the list of things that, um, stay as our focus before we um, you know, get to that June point and then we do that full analysis of our entire district of what are our needs, what comes up as common things and what comes up, what boils to the top is the things we wanna address first and we start to prioritize those because that, that's gonna be a process in itself too, right? That'll take us some, some time and then um, you know, you're looking at how long does that take to get all that work started and through architecture and everything else too? So um, I, I'm just a big advocate for supporting that program, supporting our arts, 
And um, I, I do understand there are other programs that have needs in that area, and they have come up as common themes, and I think we address those as we complete the master facilities plan and see which other, which other items start to come to the top. But this one has been a priority for quite a long time and has already been approved. Just the dollar amount has changed. So I think that's what I have to say. And we would need to know whether or not we have board consensus on that. And if so, are we sticking with the original board approved budget of one million or are we going with the three million or the five million plan if what Mrs. Hinkson is suggesting is, is that we do it prior to the master plan being completed in June. So now I know when I sat in on the meetings for that site that it continued to be their one of their main areas that they would like to address. Um, the difference between, I think, the three million was staying in the existing footprint. Well, it isn't actually the existing footprint because they were taking out the practice rooms and pushing one wall out into the planters and then leveling the floor and such. So I think that was about three million. And then a, a totally new facility was around about five million. So that's the question there. Um, you know, it, it's always, if, if we build the new facility, we're building it to the needs of the program, okay? So do we want to, you know, it's, it's, it's the question of, do we, do we do what we knew, need to to accommodate an existing facility or do we do what we need to to really accommodate long-term future, so? I think it's two questions. The first question is, do we have consensus on the board to move forward with a TMS model prior to the master facilities plan being completed, or do you prefer to wait? And if you do prefer to move forward, then we would need to know to what extent. Well, and the other point I think on that too is if we, I mean, right now we, we don't have a lot of projects moving forward. If we do move forward with this, we can submit an application and we can get it on that list of hopefully getting the 60-40 match for um, modernization on that. whether or not we have board consensus to, to wait until the master facilities plan is done and then look at it holistically where it comes in the priorities of all the sites or move forward based on the fact that the board, the previous board had approved it at the $1 million cost. Well, we would, we would need three, right? So, Just a question. Um, so those other items listed there under prioritization and focus, um, are those listed to be considered in the master facilities plan or outside of that? I think they are in the master facility plan. All projects are in the master facility plan, um, but staff is recommending that those three things are our immediate focus for the next year. We bring back projects that sp specify how much we're going to spend on each one of those, see what's left, and then prioritize the remaining projects out of what's left. So All of those were on our old master facilities plan then were ones that we were, had already approved except for the home instead because that just came mm -hmm. about. So, so then what, what staff is suggesting is to put those at the top of the list on the new plan? Is that what I'm understanding? What we're requesting is that um, <laughs> Sorry. there is the master facility plan and that's separate. Kay. But for, for staff's focus of time, and commitment of funds and projects putting together. Let's start here because we don't know how much phase two is going to cost us for the K-8 site. We don't know how much placing home instead so is, is going to be and we don't know how much phase two of Chaparral High School modernization is. And so we're asking to focus our efforts there and then prioritize everything else that's left because those feel like the immediate priority mm -hmm. that we'd like to focus our time and attention and dollars on. Meaning so now. So yes. to do this Meaning before no. June, before that's all done, exactly, you would like to get started on those, regardless of whether or not we go for a bond, currently. regardless of the yeah facility yeah. master okay. plan. Th those are really in my in my head though. Those are carryovers from pre any of this new work because those are things that we identified off the old master's facility plan and had uh, approved off the old master's facilities plan as projects that we wanted to work on before we ever even made a decision to um, have, go out and have a consultant create our new, our new master facilities plan. So it's kind of a carryover. From so to clarify, those items were a carryover from the 
previous master facility plan, and but the TMS ban room wasn't included in that master facility plan? Yeah. So, so w it would seem to me that we would potentially, if we decided to do this, put all four of those items, because doesn't TMS, if you're saying it was part of that, wouldn't all four items just be considered as the priority to look at how much do they cost, where is it, how much money do we have for it, and focus on those before moving to the plan, the new one? We can do that. Oh. And that's really the question that we're posing. <laughs> so the bottom line is, <laughs> if we were to wait until June when our master plan is completed and yeah. then start having conversations about facilities again, we've lost the next few months. So we just want to highlight for the board that this is what staff believes, at least the top three. The fourth one was really a question for you. But we have to continue to focus on the K-8 school, finding a home for home instead, and chaparral modernization. Right. I believe it was phase one that was previously previously approved, but I could be incorrect, maybe phase two was approved. And just a little bit of background on the previous master facility plan that we were going off of, it was established probably a decade prior and had just been kind of rolled forward and updated each year. So it wasn't like we went out to all the sites and said, what do you need this year, every single year? At the end of it, it, it was a, really a product from probably a decade prior. So that's why we're saying now, um, do we evaluate the new master facility plan when we're prioritizing? Um, be, and again, the top three we know we have to do right now, in our opinion, those are the priority. We just don't know with now this new information of we, we have how many sites asking for, you know, uh, shade structures. And we could put, with $3 million, we could put shade stru structures at 17, all 17 elementary school sites. So now is that the priority or is it still the TMS band room? I guess that's our question because we do have that new master facility plan now. We've gathered a lot of information. And so you're right, Mrs. Hinkson, we know these carried over and we knew we had to do those. Um, but again, we, we don't have to do K-8 site phase two. We could leave that alone at phase one and have it at its current occupancy. Our recommendation is we move forward with phase two and prioritize funding towards that. But so in this discussion, right, it's for us to determine if these three items are as is, if we add one like the TMS band room, if we prioritize something else, right, like shade structures or, or whatever. So that's the purpose of this conversation. And then ultimately what we have to give them direction on is, mm -hmm. are we good with those three? Are we adding the fourth? I think that the, prior constraints. the prioritization of like shade structures and all those other things that are coming up, um, uh, multi-purpose rooms or gyms for middle schools or whatever, that's, that's not even a conversation yet. That's a conversation when we get the results of the new master facilities plan and we see what <laughs> our school sites have said, our community has said, what's come up is the common things, what have come, what's come up is the, um, I think Kevin said there'd be a master facilities plan for each site, right? So at that point, once we have that, is when we actually prioritize what do we want to accomplish now. These are the projects that we, you know, had identified before as what do we want to accomplish um, uh, at, at that <laughs> point. So. so for this conversation, unless you have something you want to jump in. What, what, well, what we have to have a discussion on is specific to, I mean, it sounds like unless someone has a difference of opinion from what they're recommending, right? The discussion is TMS and where that was paused several months ago was when we came to moving forward with the master facility plan was saying, all right, we approved a million. Now to do, after the, the committee, it was three, and then it was like, well, is three really gonna get them what they wanted, and then five, and it kind of coincided with construction costs going out of control, and so we just hit the pause button and said, well, let's get the master facility plan started and going, and now this is what they're asking us to do, because we're not gonna have that master facility plan until June. So for us, our discussion right now needs to be do we add this and we need three people to give the thumbs up to Dr. McClay or do we pause it and say, let's come back in June and see where it, where it ranks? Now, well, I wasn't Nicole, giving my opinion. I, I was just trying to clarify what we need to accomplish. I'm sorry, could I ask you a question, Nicole? Sure, Mr. Schwartz. Um, this is aimed at Nicole. Um, in terms of what is the most financially prudent way to deal with this, uh, would it be to 
go ahead and move ahead with the ban room now, or would it be to propose it and look to get matching funds for it? Or if we propose it now, do we still get matching funds? I just want to try to figure out what's the best way to pay for it. The That's matching the funds will not us. expire, Mr. Schwartz. So even if we, we do it later, we won't lose out on those matching dollars. It won't, it won't matter if we do it now or later in terms of how much it's going to cost us. In terms of qualifying for matching, it won't matter. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Broch, you've been waiting patiently. So I am mostly probably addressing Mrs. Hankson more than anything um, because I hear you and I know that this is super important and because it's been in the works for so long, I really struggle with the three to $5 million for the band room. When I look on here and see like Chaparral phase one is the district contribution was $2,375,000, I think. Um, I just feel like for one program, that's so much. And then what happens to the other middle schools? I'm gonna reference back to uniforms. I think that Chaparral got uniforms once and it caused us tension for band um, through Great Oak and TV because they didn't get the band uniforms at that time. So without having the master facility plan done, I feel like we don't know what all the needs are and what if we do run out of money. The three projects that are up there, um, while Home Instead, again, was probably wasn't on the radar, I feel so strongly that we need to finish that K-8 school. And then we have a high school that's dilapidated over time because it's at its mark. Yeah, I, and I know you support that. This is my my struggle is three to five million dollars on a band room. That's where I struggle. If it was a million, I would probably be inclined to agree with that and say, you know, that's what's needed. But three to five million dollars just seems like so much money when we start seeing the needs of our entire district. Is that where it is? In the shade structure, I mean, I think that's important at our elementary schools, especially as warm as we get and we're back in school in August. That's just an example, not not really in comparison, but there's items like that. I don't know what else is out there that we need. Again, that it's that that dollar amount, I think, that has me sticker shocked still to date. Just saying, if, if we run out of money, what's going to suffer in comparison to, to one school? I mean, we're modernizing an entire high school right now at $5 million until phase two goes in, and half over half of that is is matching from the state, if I'm reading this correctly. Mrs. Lash, is that right? So phase one for Chaparral was? was Phase one total cost is $12.4 million. Um, now, whether or not we qualify for, for matching and get reimbursed for matching, but phase one will cost us $12.4 million. And, what and is the we haven't touched half of the things that that site is requesting. Phase one, if you'll recall, is all the things we knew we had to do. Um, so what's that? She's what? looking at 2022 on this. Form. So this so is so just is potential district? matching yeah. if it's okay. in the right place. So remember, this is aging facilities. So it has to be those exact facilities that we touch that are 25 or 20 years old in order to qualify for so, matching. So for phase one, our contribution not it was 2.3 million or 2. almost 4 million, correct? Are we touching the right things to Am qualify I, for? Actually, we can touch anything on the campus for the modernization. Perfect. So yeah. the first, um, that's right I'm now. Our cost is twelve million dollars because okay. there's no matching funds right now. But if the state has it, right now we would qualify for that much matching. That's how much we could the, qualify the for. But remember, I showed you the state's out of money, right? And so we could submit for matching dollars for these things, but right now there are no matching funds available. We are footing the bill for 12.43 million. If you notice next year, Chaparral actually qualifies for more and mm -hmm. just strategically, we'll probably wait until next year to put in the application. Mm -hmm. So we can put in one application that covers more of it rather than kind of wasting our what we've spent on it on a minor match in. So to clarify, this match. is not funds we've committed. Okay. This is eligibility for state matching oh, based okay. on the Thank aging you. of our facilities. I apologize. I, I probably didn't. Uh, oh, no. Explain I was just looking well. at it thinking if we contributed right under, as a district, 2.4 million, that I'm like, that's for a whole We're, we're actually doing more than that. Okay. Right. We're spreading it across. 
some of our things say phase one and phase two because we're spreading it across two summers, but it's all part of the, the first phase that was approved by the board. So if you think of costs for Chaparral, we're spending $12.43 million, and you saw the list. It's like six, it's five yeah. things potentially. It's the fire alarm, it's the theater, it's the entrance into the gym, it's the HVAC um, replacing the swamp coolers, and um, the, the, par the, the parking, parking lot, lot. A bunch of ADA work. When you touch something, you yeah. have to bring it up to current ADA code. So that, just phase one, is going to cost us $12.5 We haven't talked uh, addressing the concern with the multi-purpose room or, or lack thereof um, and things like that. So I just, to put it into perspective how expensive things are, phase one alone is going to cost us $12.4 million. So maybe just to, because I was looking at that too, yeah. but maybe just to read your mind a little bit. Yeah. Like, so in terms of just trying to quantify how much we're spending on what, it sounds like all the items that you're listing when you're talking about ADA and you're talking about yeah. AC and you're talking about massive things. Have we ever had, in when we're looking at these lists of um, schools that were doing modernization or any construction, have we ever had one singular program qualify for a significant amount of dollars for their own sort of facility or I mean, I, the only one I think of is the culinary. I was just going to say the about. culinary and building, the theater. The theater, and the theater. We built a, a yeah. we built a new band room and a new multi-purpose room at Margarita. I mean, that's that's another example of there was a need, mm. and so you know um, to support the program, and so I guess yeah, when you're saying two million for Chaparral, I know it's going to be much greater than that. It's going to be much greater than twelve million. Okay, that's an initial phase where we said. We need to get this project moving. There are some immediate things that need to happen right now, okay? The, the next phase you know, is, is still some of those immediate things, but my guess is, is once we come back and finish the master facilities plan, we're going to um, be looking at a much larger um, modernization overall for Chaparral. Um, you know, it, I mean, in my mind, I see things like what, what, what Rancho looks like now or you know what we did at Vail, um, it needs that step up. And so, I, I mean, we don't know the number yet for that. We just know here's some initial things that needed to be done. And, and for me, I know three million sounds like a lot of, lot of money, but you know, just last month on our consent calendar, we approved $2 million in, um, in fees related to a project, right? And that was, and, and I don't think anybody blinked on that, right? Because, and that was just, those were soft, do we call them soft costs? The, um, associated costs for management fees and architects and things like that. So when we're looking at that kind of money for a total project, um, you know, and we're looking at, um, we have $80 million currently in available funds, um, plus additional monies will be coming in, plus we can put it in for reimbursement. Um, and it's a program that we've identified as far back as more than 10 years ago. It's been sitting on our master's facility plan as a high need to support the program. Now, do we have some other needs in, in band? Yeah. Or in our arts in other places? Absolutely. And hopefully we're going to see those and take some action on those in the master facilities plan going forward. This is something we identified. We're ready to move forward with, you know, and it's, it's, it's just ready to go. And I, I just think it's a shame that we can't support our, our program. So I, I agree with you. And I don't want you, I don't want anyone to think that I'm, I don't want to support the program. I, think when we do these projects, the fees change, or we get change orders, and then they get ramped up and ramped up. If this is coming in at a million, I would, I think that would be, an, for me, an easy yes. Personally, it's the three to five, but I'm like, well, is that really four to six or four to seven? That's where my concern comes in yeah. when we have, we don't know what the costs are. Sure, the, the other longer you wait, the higher they go, right? right? And yeah, absolutely. The, the problem right is, is the amount of work that has to be done there, because the facility is poor, so poorly designed that it doesn't support the program in its current um, the current arrangement or physical um, arrangement that it has. It just doesn't support. And when we talk about BAN, this is one of those unique programs where they don't limit the size or the number. That's correct. And that's so, not an option to bridge the gap so that it's... No, because, you know, in, in that program specifically, you, the, you want to have that enrollment. First of all, you know, when we're talking about connection to school, that particular school has over a third of the students are connected to school in the arts, okay? 
Well, actually, I think it's closer to 50% if we add in all the arts at that school, if you add in uh, chorus, theater, um, visual arts, and, and uh, music. So they, they have a very high participation in the arts. And when you think of what our students have been through and how important connection to school is when we talk about all of these programs and CTE programs and the mental health and the connection that they that gives kids. I can just tell you from my own personal experience, you know, I'm married to a band director for over 20 years now. Um, and also having my own student that, you know, students when they, they go through band, they have th three years in middle school, that they come to a class where they recognize peers, they form connections, they form relationships. It's a place where they feel comfortable, they feel supported. Um, and it even when they transition into high school and think how difficult that's been for our kids now who are making these transitions after being online or have being isolated, you know, feeling that isolation and such. When you can go from middle school to high school and know that you're gonna walk into a class where there's familiar faces and where you have buddies who um, are seniors or juniors who have been, um, who are your partners and help you to fit in, okay? And you're, you're going to a school of 3,000 kids. Um, a lot of our students feel very lost. And I would just say the camaraderie, um, and we have so many kids who that's what they come to school for, okay? And yes, our academics are extraordinarily important and I 100% support that. But I support all of our programs, and I really think our CTE programs, our electives, our, um, our arts, our sports, our athletics are so important for us to support, and um, they're so meaningful to so many of our kids, okay? And, and that's why I'm such an advocate for this program that has a history of being our largest band program in our district larger than our high school programs. More students have been engaged in this over the last 20 years. That's just been the history. Um, and so I just think that it's a very important thing for us to support, the, and the facility is a huge mi mismatch, okay? So. Any, anything anyone else wants to add? So where we're at, and if there are other questions or comments is we would need three people to say, yes, they wanna add that TMS up into the prioritization and focus and a dollar amount. I'll give, I mean, so people have time to think about it. I hear you, I support it 100% where, where you're coming from and the programs, the arts, I don't think we wanna be um, giving the impression that uh, where we are for trying to balance being fiscally responsible and doing the right thing or, or what's important doesn't mean that we don't care about arts and programs. For me, I think, uh, like Mrs. Broch was saying, I think a million um, make, would make sense when it came back. It felt like three million wasn't adequate for the needs. It was kind of like a Band-Aid. And the five million made um, the most uh, sense for what the band director was looking for and the needs of the school. And when we get to that $5 million um, amount, I go back to, although it's um, disappointing to delay it further, I would say we've engaged the master facility plan. It is a few more months. We're midway through March here. I would say if we're looking at that dollar amount, I would be on the side of waiting until we're completed that, complete, completing that, and then prioritize from there. So that's are, my Are sense. you in support of the intermediate plan to uh, just modernize in the existing facility and not build a new facility? Um, Which is the, th about, it was about three million at the time. Yeah, that so we were my answer, at it. I, sorry, maybe I didn't clarify that. So my, my, my impression on that was it was the band aid approach that even though it's three million, which is a lot of money, it felt like we were doing something that was better than nothing, but it doesn't feel like that would provide the solution, which I would love to see in the master facility plan when it comes through and we talk to the community and we have everything prioritized and listed out and we go, hey, we're comfortable spending $6 million because if we're gonna do it, think of the culinary arts and the theater and let's do it right. So the reason why I'm saying I'm not a fan of the Band-Aid solution is I feel like that wouldn't be, and I, I don't know if you agree with me or not, but I feel like that wouldn't be the solution that would last very long. I feel like we'd come back here in five to six years and say, 
not enough, it's already falling apart, it's not good, or whatever. We're still limited. It significantly expands their space and makes their space more usable. It would create a facility that would accommodate their needs. Would it accommodate it as well as something built from the ground up that's built to add specs per, you know, what a band room needs? Um, and not as much, no, but would it, would it um, accommodate the program, yes. Okay. Based on the numbers, we'd still be over capacity, though, right? In that room, like the we'd number of students really, that really would need close. to be in there. Yeah, yeah. That, that's be, my point. We'd be really close, but right now we're like really close. Yeah. yeah okay. So <laughs> we, one we less don't, really. We don't fit anymore. <laughs> okay. So that's my two cents. Um. Yeah. This is a tough one, but I guess that's what we signed up for. Uh, so. I mean, in my mind, I, I hear that the board before us or whichever board that was prioritized that and, and I completely respect that because we didn't have all that same information, I don't have that same information, but they also prioritized it at $1 million and perhaps, we don't know, we don't have a time machine to go back, but if it was planned that it was $5 million at that point, would it have been prioritized? I don't know. Um, I think personally, I would be most comfortable with um, keeping a little asterisk by it as a top priority in the new facilities master plan, knowing that historically it has been a priority and maybe some new things bubbling up that aren't emergencies, but we had made a commitment to that school and to those kids and to that community to make a better band room um, that we could keep that at the top of our new facilities master plan, but wait until we see everything in case there are some super urgent needs that come above that because five, and I'm with Adam, I mean, I have tiny experience in renovating and building facilities and if you go for the cheap route, you always regret it. You wanna do the best thing possible and it's not worth, in, in my opinion, not worth investing $3 million when you should have done five and you could have, and then your three million is somewhat wasted and it's so short term. Five million, um, you know, if it truly is the, you know, showcase band, we should put the five million in, but do it right when we can do it and afford it in, in our priority list. Um, and I think some of these other things have, have bubbled up and, and it's hard to say this, but the number of kids that benefit from a new HVAC system, um, versus a band room is, you know, it's kind of hard. We want all programs, obviously. And I hear you with the, we need to, it's, school is not just about academics, you know, 100%. And I think that we should do that program justice, but possibly we might be better served to put it at the top of the new facilities plan rather than um, try to shuffle in a project that maybe won't be high quality or what, the, what they really need. Well, I don't disagree with that because we have, I mean, some of the projects we've done before when we look at, I mean, there's there's a new band room at Temecula Valley High School, the theater, the science room, the culinary arts room, um, the new uh, band and um, NPR over at Margarita. I mean, when we have done those and done them right, we have facilities that will sustain us for the future, okay? So ideally, that's, that's you know, the, the hope, um, but I think that we need to recognize that they are really struggling to work in that facility that they have right now. We need to, you know, make sure that it is high on our um, awareness that it's, it's definitely a need. And, and I'd like to hear what you have to say too, Dr. McClay. Well, I was just gonna say it's fascinating listening to this entire dialogue because it's almost an absolute mirror of the conversations that we've had in cabinet. We've gone round and round on this topic. Anyone who's been in the TMS band room when students are present um, is first fascinated by what a phenomenal program it is, but then right then all of a sudden stunned with, oh my goodness, there's there's no room to move. And I'm, I'm going on record as saying that. It is way too crowded in that room to house the number of students who want to engage. And that is one of our goals, is to engage and connect students to school. We've had the same dialogue with, well, it doesn't make sense to do the one million because it's, it, even the committee said it, it's not worth it. Doing the three million, is that a five-year fix? Is it a three-year fix? Is it a 10-year fix? Whatever it is, 
it's not enough. And so to allocate the five million right now without staying what we have defined as true to the process of the facilities master plan, because it is such a difference between one and five. And we all know that, as you've said, five sometimes turns into six or turns into seven. So please don't think cabinet's recommendation is a no on this. Cabinet's recommendation was, A, we wanna do it right, but B, let's finish the facilities master plan process. It's just a few months. If we're talking about wanting to, to build a new facility and to do something right, waiting a few months isn't going to hurt us, um, but let's let all 28 sites give their input, list their needs, so that then we can reprioritize. Do all of us believe that is still gonna end up very high on the list? We do, um, but it's important to let that process finish. So that's where we landed, but it was after an immense amount of dialogue very similar to what you've gone through. And, and we're okay going the other way, we just need three people. Um, ultimately, it's your decision and that's why we're here. Mr. Schwartz, did you want to say anything? I mean, so we're looking for right now, I know obviously Mrs. Hankson is saying, or have you kind of, you're a what? I'm a go. You're a go. Is anybody else, Mr. Schwartz, are you a go or are you? I can't, I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear what Sandy said. Oh, her mic wasn't on. Oh, I'm sorry, I said I'm a go. I think it's been far too long that this has been an issue and a problem. You know, it dates back 20 years, really. It was never built to, it was built to accommodate 35 students, not to accommodate 200 students. Or, well, we don't have, we have up to 60 in a class, okay? Um, so it was never built for the size, size of programs that we have there. So I, I'm a go right now, just like I think there were, you know, I was a go for Chaparral right now, too. And I think, you know, regardless of where we're at on our new master facilities plan, I'm a go for Chaparral, I'm a go for the K-8 school, and I'm a go for Home Instead Academy because those are things we know are huge things we need to support our students, right? So. Mr. Schwartz, any thoughts? Uh, I thought I felt the way I wanted to vote uh, after listening to everybody. Um, I'm gonna harken back to uh, something that my father used to say, when you buy cheap, you get cheap. Um, not that we're talking about a million dollars or three million being cheap, but I think when we're looking for a solution, I think we wanna find a solution that's gonna be permanent, not temporary. So although I did believe that we should do something uh, now, uh, I think I agree with Allison and the cabinet that we should put this on top of our master facilities list and fund it um, adequately to make it a permanent uh, facility. Thank you, Mr. Schwartz. Okay, on that note. I think we have direction. Yeah, do you have direction on that? We do, we want to okay. call to discuss tonight. So, so now it's bringing up uh, the discussion on the bond. I have to call for a motion on that, yep. So I call for a motion and a second to approve the contract with TBWBH props and measures to provide a feasibility study and consulting services for a possible future general obligation bond. Moved. Moved by Mrs. Hinkson. Second. Seconded by Mr. Schwartz. All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, opposed? Motion Wait. carries 5-0. Okay, we didn't talk about it. We just voted on it. To open up the discussion. Oh, to open the discussion. Okay, I'm sorry. Are you gonna, Mrs. Lash? So we have Mr. Charles Heath here with the consulting company. Should you have any questions specifically for him? I know I've put some information in Friday memos past, um, but if if you have any questions regarding process, I know he's here. <clears throat> and and I was gonna say, and the direction we're looking Got for it. is, are we going to move forward with polling the community? Uh, and hiring a consultant firm to pull the community to take the temperature, again, not to commit to move forward for a bond, but to move forward with polling the community. Uh, and then we would bring those results back to the board for consideration of where to go from there. So this is more of a just conversation, there's no presentation on? Correct, okay. and if you won't have questions on process or timing or things like that, I know um, Mr. Heath is an expert in the area. Yeah, I wanted to ask a question. So when you're saying polling the community, 
So I know that you know part of the process is um, sort of educating the community as to what it means, what the cost is, uh, what is it that they would be getting for their money, right? So um, what would that look like in this, this particular situation? Sure, so um, the, what we call the feasibility study is the first step in a multi-step process to prepare a bond measure for the ballot. And this is the step where we're really trying to take the temperature of the community and understand if you were to put a bond on the ballot, does it stand a reasonable chance of success? And if we have a, a yes as an answer to that question, then we invest in the subsequent steps to then prepare a measure for the ballot. But we don't want to get too far down the road before we uh, know that this is realistic in the current environment. Um, so this is traditional public opinion polling using the same kind of methodology that you use for all types of polling for candidate issues and, and whatnot. Uh, I partner with a, public, in, a public, re, uh, public opinion research specialist whose job is to help us design a statistically reliable sample of the voters that are likely to vote in the election that you're looking at, potentially November 2022. And then we go through a process of contacting those voters and presenting to them information about your potential bond. So that'll include information about your identified facility needs, the available funding sources you have to address those needs, what a potential bond measure might look like, what the bond amounts and tax rates associated with that measure might look like. Uh, we also collect information on what their project priorities are. Um, and through that process, we understand, okay, if you put a measure on the ballot, here's the level of support it might garner, but also how do you optimize that measure to align with community priorities and sensitivities? And so basically over the course of the survey, we sort of simulate the kind of discussion and debate that happens in a campaign. So people start off knowing very little, you can kind of present, well, here's a concept up front. Do you support it? We measure support, but then we add additional information to the equation and see how that changes support. And that way we can not only tell you, here's where you are today, but here's where you might be after we go through a process of having a discussion with the community. So w where would the piece come where um, we help them with their awareness on that slide that uh, Mrs. Lash showed that showed us as being second from the bottom and tax rate with you know, comparable um, cities nearby in our in Riverside County would that would that come out as part of that as information or um, that, that would likely be one of the information points that would be presented to voters and we'll see if that's persuasive information and to what extent that uh, uh, changes people's opinions uh, if we find among uh, the, the sample that we survey that that's persuasive information that people think that that's important then that's used to then build a communication and outreach effort subsequent to the feasibility study to basically tell that story far and wide to your electorate in general. I have a quick question. How much time do you need to conduct a reliable survey? I mean, start to finish from the design of the survey, conduct the survey, analyze the results, and bring findings back to you. It's about a two-month process. Two-month process. Two-month process, yeah. Oh, okay. And if you, if you want to place a measure on the November 2022 ballot, the board is going to face a deadline at the beginning of August. It's August 12th this year. That's the date by which you have to take to the county registrar of voters a board adopted resolution saying we want to have an election. So we're, we're moving on a timeline such that if we get a green light from the polling, we can still do some of that outreach, build a strong measure for you, and bring it back for approval. Sometimes we start this process and you know it's not that smooth and you know we encounter challenges and whatnot that we need to work around through communication strategies or maybe there's better timing down the line and then we regroup and recalibrate for potentially a 2024 election. And do we know the cost associated with engaging a consultant to do the polling? Or sure, um, so there's two pieces of that. There's the actual conducting of the poll itself, you know, making the phone calls, sending the emails, sending the text messages. That's about $28,000. Uh, and then there's my consulting services to kind of design and interpret the results, which is roughly another 20,000. So it's about 48,000 total to get you through the feasibility study. And that's all in one contract. And so both the polling and the oversight of the process are both uh, included in the cost of the contract that's up for uh, your approval tonight. So the approval tonight, so, oh, sorry. I was just gonna say that is in that document that you gave us, but I'm just curious because it had um, the schedule of prices on the last page with the 28.5 and then the 31.6 for brochures, but then within the contract it's 6,500 a month. So this contract could take us to all the way until August if we decide to go out for a bond and it would cover all of the cost of the, and you could answer this as well, um, all of the cost of going out for a bond. So um, all of the things leading up to August what he's referring to is just to get us through the polling component alone, 
is the 48,000 if we went, took it all the way and put it on the, the ballot for November 2022. It would be per month, right? For, so from now until August, and then all the costs associated with that. It gets us to that 165,000 if we took it all the way. So it would be, sorry, the, the, what's listed on schedule of prices, that's for the feasibility study. And the 6,500 is in addition to that plus the extra months? No. So the okay. 285 is the polling cost, which is part one piece of the feasibility study. Uh -huh. And then basically the 6,500 times like two, two and a half months is the other piece of the feasibility study. So those two pieces together is the 48. Um, the total amount, if we're going through August, includes the 31, I can't remember what the number is for the brochures. But that, oh, okay. that anticipates we've gotten past the feasibility study. It's a green light. Now we want to start educating the community, so we have to produce and send some information out to the public. But okay. we're going to be back in front of you presenting the results of the feasibility study, getting your authorization to move forward before we incur any of those additional costs. Okay, got it. So this contract is for the feasibility study, and then also if we say it's a go, it would cover us through August. And then what happens after that? Do you continue? Are you the person that would help us get the bond so, passed? You know, we have some <laughs> um, so by law, school district resources cannot be used to advocate for the passage of the bond. So okay. we have to look at this in phases. And there's the district planning and preparation phase, which could just be the feasibility study, but it could also be through August we put a measure on the ballot. But in any scenario, once you put on the ba a measure on the ballot, the That's district it. has to step back and an independent campaign committee can step forward to advocate for the passage of the measure, but they have to use private resources that are raised outside of the school district. Um, my firm does provide consulting services to those advocacy campaigns to finish the process August through November, but that's a separate agreement, separate funding source. You couldn't approve it even if you wanted to. Okay, got it. So the full commitment of the district, if we did find that this was a great time to do it, would only be this 165. Okay, Correct. got it. Thank you. Um, deepening Mrs. Hingson's question, are we going to educate our community to what our school needs are before we pull them? That's kind of the intent of the facility master plan okay. and those uh, community meetings is, you know, w the status of existing facilities and then dream dream the dream. What what do you foresee? What are your your what's your wish list items? And like I when I mentioned timing, it's fresh off the heels of those community meetings, it would le lend itself to, well, if we had the funds, so here's what we could potentially use those for. So if those community meetings were not well attended, how else would we reach the community? Um, just taking the band room into consideration, how would we engage the TMS parents? Or at um, Great Oak, how would we engage those that demographic of parents to say, hey, this is what it's going to do for you school specifically. Yeah. So in the course of the survey that we're conducting, we're going to convey to the respondents that kind of information to see how that influences their opinion about the bond. I mean, frankly, you're exactly in the place that virtually every school district is when they start considering a bond measure. They haven't already fully educated the public because before they do that, they kind of want to see, you know, is this really in the cards? Because it's expensive, mm -hmm. right? And it's time consuming and this district has other priorities. So we sort of take it in this incremental approach. And if it looks like if we in introduce this information through the survey process and it moves us to a place where we're comfortable, we can pass a bond, then we make the big investment to go engage with the parent groups and go to the broader community, right? I mean, 70% of your voters don't have kids in the school district. They have no clue, right? So they really have to be a focus of an education and outreach effort before you put a bond measure on the ballot. But typically we do that sort of in a linear fashion after we know that this is viable. Oh, thank you. And then I'm sure, um, Dr. Valdez or Dr. McClare, those, uh, those of us that have been through uh, passing a bond measure know once the consultant agreement uh, ends and the district is out of it, it's uh, administrators spending their evenings making phone calls, it's sending out mail, things in the mail, it's things that post on social media, it's, it's uh, staff in their own time attempting yeah. to go out and advocate to get it passed. Yeah, correct, me if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, because it's been probably at least a decade or so, Mrs. Dixon, since we did Measure Y, but there- 2012. 2012, oh, okay, a decade. Yeah. So yeah. there can be zero use of district resources. I mean, even down to my laptop, down to work hours, nothing. It all would occur after hours. Um, people would volunteer. 
Absolutely. So, it's yeah. state law. There are yeah. consequences if you misappropriate public funds. So you want to be very careful that what you're doing as a district is planning and preparing a measure for the ballot, providing impartial information to the community, but any advocacy is clearly separate and privately funded. Okay, and if I'm understanding it correctly too, when we go out for a bond, um, the, the language that we include in the bond, we have to first, I mean, I'm, that's part of the purpose of the master facilities plan is to identify what it is we want to accomplish with the bond. And I think that started, Allison, you asked a question right at the beginning about that. And so the things that we included in the last um, bond measure Y um, had to do with facilities improvements. We couldn't do anything that was uh, short-term items that had a life of less than 10 years or technology or some of those kinds of things. Only a certain percentage of the money could be spent on that. I mean, there were certain guidelines, but I think um, that's where this whole ed tech thing comes in. Uh, your, your committees that are gonna go out and kind of help establish that vision and what are the things, and we wanna be general, not specific. We don't wanna say this money is for the TMS band room. You wanna say um, maybe, you know, imp VAPA improvements or things like that, if that's part of the goal of it, okay? So we do have to identify so the community knows what they are voting for and what the money, the intention is for the money, so it is specified in the actual bond measure. Any other questions? I mean, so to, so to, I, I guess I'll do the, the clarity commentary. Um, unless, Mr. Schwartz, did you have anything you wanted to add? Are you good? No, you're good. Um, so just for, so number one, not, not necessarily knowing if we want to go out for the general obligation bond by engaging a consultant, it bridges the gap. I'll give you my, con my concern is timing. I don't know where we're, it doesn't feel like when you said two months, it doesn't feel like that gives us a lot of time to um, pull the public and then get all the wheels spinning with everything else we're trying to accomplish um, to put forth the effort that's needed to make it be successful. I m might be uh, projecting, but I kind of feel like there's some rehabilitation uh, work that needs to be done just between uh, the school district and the community, just getting, getting everyone back together, right? Now that we're two days into being mask optional and all the things that have kind of created some tension. So I think um, there's other rehabilitation stuff that will allow us, if we did say we're gonna pause until 24, um, it allow us the time to get there, right? So that we have um, the relationship building. Maybe we're not, I don't know when your typical time frame is to start a, a consulting or to start a poll before a bond. I don't know if it's within this. This is, this is pretty typical. This I mean, is we're getting typical. started with a lot of school districts right now that are looking at November 2022. Um, but they're all starting the process open-minded, understanding that we've come out of a crazy two years. There are a lot of unknowns yeah. out in the community. And frankly, it's the opinion research that will help you understand and ground you in like, what is the reality out there? Not like us taking a guess based on what we hear at board meetings and whatnot, but what are the real opinions of our community and our stakeholders? So it can be really helpful data for figuring out the way forward. And it may be that, you know, the vast majority of the community is happy that we're, you know, back getting to something approaching normal and it's a great time to invest in our schools. Um, the other thing I've learned over the last two years is that waiting doesn't necessarily make the problem better. Um, I don't know what the crisis around the corner is, but the last two years have taught me that there is a crisis around the corner, so the passage of time does not necessarily make things better. So, and we're actually seeing, in the polling we're doing in, in lots of communities around Southern California right now, pretty strong support for these proposals because I think relative to where we were a year ago, we're in a pretty good place. The economy is relatively strong. Will it still be in two years? I don't know. The further you get out, the more uncertainty I think you introduce. So I guess that's why, you know, just kind of sticking a finger in the wind and saying like, hey, what's the environment we're operating in? Is this, you know, a good time? You know, it's, it's a worthwhile exercise. And if you don't take that data and move forward to the ballot immediately, you learn a lot in that process to start planning for 2024 instead of just letting two years go by and then starting all over again. Thank you for that. So we have a motion on the floor. Are we at a point where we'd like to vote for it? Is there more discussion, questions? Well, the motion we had on the floor was to discuss, right? Don't we need a new motion to approve? This is saying to approve it. Okay. Um, I, I would just piggyback on, on, on what you said that, I mean, in my opinion, you know, knowledge is power. So whether or not we decide to move forward with the ballot measure, um, 
the information we get, I think is gonna, would be very important to us. Moving, even if we decided against doing it this year, it would really inform our process for the future, personally. Okay, so do you, are we at a point? Any other questions? Are we good to vote? We already had a measure that we vote, motion that we voted on though. That's why I was questioning whether we should have voted before. I think you're correct in retrospect when I look at it. So why don't we make an amended motion on the last one so that that was to discuss and now let's make the motion to approve and take a new vote. Are you comfortable with that? Yeah. Okay. Can we amend a vote, motion we already voted on? Okay. Okay, so I move that, can I make it all in one? Probably not. I move that we amend our previous motion to state that we discuss the general obligation bond. Need a second. Second. Seconded by Mrs. Barclay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Now you can call for that motion. I call for a motion and a second to approve the contract with TBWBH props and measures to provide a feasibility study and consulting services sure. for possible future general obligation bond. Moved. Moved. Moved by Mrs. Hinkson, seconded by Mr. Schwartz. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5-0. And that's it, right? Okay. Great. <laughs> the meeting okay. is adjourned Tuesday, March 15th, 2022 at 6.09 p.m. Good night.